Yeah. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm going to cover uh, some of the basics of, of how the bubbles work and how they actually interact with the uh, ultrasound systems that we use to image them. Um, and it's amazing to think that we've really come such a long way away from uh, our original uh, contrast bubble uh, usage, and this is one of my very early slides. I will not tell you how old this is, but it's in a patient with a VSD with a hand agitated saline injection. Uh, and now, um, as you'll hear, what we can do is image myocardial perfusion in 3D echo. And so this is from a full volume data set during a contrast uh, injection using flash replenishment imaging, and you'll be hearing more about this later on this session. So we've come a huge distance uh, in a relatively short period of time in terms of the use of contrast agents. Now, as you may be aware, and, and some of us in the audience in the room here uh, have been working with a variety of contrast agents over the, year, the years, many of which have unfortunately fallen by the wayside. Um, but basically, all these commercial contrast agents um, have two important features, one of which is their shell type, uh, which you can see here, and also the gas that's encapsulated within them. Um, now, a few of these agents have survived the FDA and the other regulatory authorities um, and now are available to us. Um, and uh, basically, we have across the world, we have Lumin Luminity, um, or Definity as it's uh, known here in the US, from Lantheus, Optison from GE, and Sonoview from Braco. Uh, and they're not all available, of course, in every single country. Um, but these uh, three, uh, Definity, Optison, and Sonoview, are licensed for left ventricular pacification. Um, and there are a few other agents that have attempted to obtain a license for myocardial contrast echo. Uh, and again, because of regulatory issues, have not yet quite made it. Uh, but we'll be talking a bit more about MCE later on. Now, one of the key features of a commercial transformary contrast agent is that clearly it has got to be able to persist in the circulation and survive transformary passage. And essentially, manufacturers have taken two approaches in which to achieve this. If they've created a microbubble which is, has a diffusible soluble gas such as air or nitrogen within it, then what they've done is to wrap that bubble with a thick impermeable shell. Now, this prevents the gas from diffusing outside the bubble, but does alter its acoustic properties because it makes the bubble stiff. And you'll be hearing later on in my presentation that actually having some acoustic properties to have the ability to resonate uh, can be an important feature of some of these microbubbles. So the alternative approach is to have a thin, flexible, but potentially permeable shell. And if you want to make sure that these bubbles persist and so the gas doesn't diffuse out, then what you need to use is a gas which has uh, a high molecular weight. It's insoluble and non-diffusible. And usually this is the perfluorocarbons or sulfur hexafluoride has been commonly used. The other important characteristic of a commercial contrast agent is that it has to behave physiologically. We want it to act as a tracer of blood flow. So that means that it's got to be of similar size to red blood cells. And here are some micrographs of uh, Sonoview. Uh, this is a point biosphere, which is an MCE product, which hasn't survived. Uh, and here is Optison. Um, but you can see all the, here the red blood cells surrounding these contrast microbubbles. And you can see they are roughly of the same diameter. So they can pass through the microcirculation at the same rate as red blood cells uh, and not impede the circulation. Now, the size of the microbubble, apart from being physiologically safe, has an important acoustic feature. Because this very simple formula, which I'm sure you're all writing down and memorizing, um, expresses the ratio between the uh, incident ultrasound that's fired out from our ultrasound transducer and that that's backscattered. And we really want that ratio to be as high as possible. And the key parameter within this is the radius of the bubble to the sixth power. So you can see that a small increase in bubble diameter is going to make a huge increase in terms of its backscatter intensity. So we would like the bubble to be as large as possible, but clearly if we make it large, it's not going to behave physiologically. And realistically, we needed to have a diameter of about four microns to be safe. But even if we take a bubble of that potential diameter, there is a huge increase in terms of its backscatter from blood of the order of 100 million. So it ought to make it very, very easy to see. The problem is that when we're doing myocardial contrast echocardiography, 
the amount of contrast microbubbles that appear in the tissues themselves, in the organs, um, such as the kidneys or in the myocardium, is very, very small. So we still need to use very sensitive and, um, and complicated systems to actually detect them. Now, fortunately, as I've already implied, these microbubbles have a few acoustic properties which we can tap into uh, to make them easier to see. And one of them is that they actually oscillate asymmetrically. So as pressure increases, and of course sound waves are a pressure wave, so as we put one of these bubbles in a sound wave, it's going to compress at the uh, high point of the pressure and then expand. But it can actually get larger, then it gets smaller for the same pressure difference. So that means it oscillates asymmetrically, and these asymmetric vibrations generate harmonics. So this is really the genesis of second harmonic imaging, which of course many of us think was perhaps developed for looking, improving our tissue appreciation. In fact, it was a technique that was originally developed for contrast echo. Um, and so we know that if we put contrast microbubbles in an ultrasound field, um, not only do they backscatter at the fundamental frequency, the same frequency that we transmit, but also at the second and third and fourth harmonics. The difference being here is that the tissue does not resonate so much at the, at the second harmonic, and so the difference between the contrast and the tissue is greater, and potentially that would make it as easier for us to see them. Now there's a lot of serendipity in contrast echocardiography, and one of them is that if we look at the bubble diameter that we need to use of roughly around about four, diameter, uh, four microns, then the resonant frequency falls beautifully between 1.5 megahertz and 5 megahertz, which is within the bandwidth, the frequency bandwidth, that we use for echocardiography. And if that coincidence, that serendipity didn't exist, then it's very unlikely that any of us would be here in this meeting talking about co contrast echocardiography, because that's one of the key features that makes this all work. Now, one of the other important issues is that as we increase the ultrasound power, then we certainly get bubbles starting to cause harmonics, but very soon they will rupture. And here at 100%, which is the standard me uh, mechanical power that we use for ordinary transthoracic echocardiography, we will destroy contrast microbubbles. So the very thing that we're trying to look at in the image in the heart and in the body is actually destroyed by the ultrasound that we're trying to look at it with. So in fact, to avoid um, destruction, we have to operate far more down the scale. So typically, you'll image with an MI of 1.2 to 1.5, and we have to image these contrast microbubbles at an MI of about 0.1 or even less. So that means that we have to use other methods to pick them up. And I'm not going to go, there's many, many different methods, but they all work on fundamentally similar principles. Um, and all the manufacturers have their slight spin on this. So this is uh, how it often can work, because what happens is you fire multiple pulses down each scan line. And the first pulse will cause the bubble to excite, cause it to change in properties, perhaps break up into smaller bubbles, and then when the second pulse comes out, that's fired a few microseconds later, it actually is backscattered off a different uh, surface than the bigger bubble. And so you get a different signal coming back. Let's just look at that again. The first pulse comes out. It makes the bubble os oscillate, break up. The second pulse comes out, and then there's a difference. And what the ultrasound system does is look at the difference between the first pulse, the, the echo coming back from the first pulse, and the second one. And if there's a difference, then it says it's coming from contrast. If it's the same, it says it's coming from tissue. And what the system does is suppress the tissue so that all we see is the contrast. Now, the other thing that we have to consider is how we actually administer these contrast microbubbles, and we can use either a bolus or an infusion. In our lab, uh, certainly giving a bolus is easier and it's cheaper because you use less contrast, but the concentration is changing all the time. Um, it doesn't work well for perfusion or for 3D echo. So an infusion can be given through a dedicated pump, as you can see here, and, or else you can do it through an IV. It's more controllable. You can uh, help reduce the effects of attenuation and artifacts. The concentration you can maintain as being constant over a long period of time, uh, which makes it more suitable for MCE and for 3D, but you do end up using more contrast, and of course you have the cost of the pump and the IV as well. So let me conclude with just a couple of uh, clinical cases of how we actually use contrast these days. 
So here's a typical patient who we might wonder whether there's a thrombus in the apex of the LV, and I'm sure that many of you, just as I did when I was presented this echo, uh, thought that this was likely to be a reverberation artifact. Indeed, it may well be, but I thought it was unlikely that this patient had thrombus. But following a bolus injection of a commercial contrast agent, you can see that clearly there is a thrombus in the apex of the left ventricle. Now contrast that to this case here, where when I was shown this one, I almost said, well, we don't really need to use contrast. It's pretty obvious that there's a thrombus sitting at the apex of the left ventricle. Uh, so this is at 1456. By the time we put the IV in and given the contrast, it's now 10 past uh, 3 in the afternoon, and you can see that actually there's better LV con contraction at the apex than we might imagine, uh, and no thrombus seen there. So two cases where our management was radically changed. Now, this is another technique you'll hear about, I'm sure, from the other speakers. This is flash replenishment imaging, where we image at a low MI, give a high-intensity burst, which destroys the contrast in the myocardium. Then we watch the rate and also the plateau. And from that, we can get some relative quantitative information about MCE. So here it is used in a subjective way in a patient undergoing a stress echo. The patient has got some risk factors for coronary disease, atypical chest pain. Um, and you can see here at peak stress, now there is a wall motion abnormality in the lateral wall and the posterior wall, but if you have any doubt about that, you can clearly see this perfusion defect extending from here all the way down the lateral wall and down here all the way down the posterior wall in this patient who had a critical circumflex lesion. Compare that to the septum uh, here, which is well perfused. So I'm just going to skip past this because my time is almost out. That's just looking at 3D perfusion and come to my conclusion slide. So ultrasound contrast agents are safe, and I haven't had time to, to dis discuss that, but we may be able to do that in the question session. It should be used in combination with the contrast-specific imaging modalities, and all vendors have those available. They can be administered as a bolus or an LVO, and I think there are different settings uh, where that's helpful. They have an essential role in patients with poor echo windows, and I've given you a couple of examples, and you can see others on the slide there. We use them in at least 75% of our stress echo cases, but 100% when we want to use, look at perfusion. It adds little time or relative cost, adds user confidence and accuracy, and I believe that soon perfusion stress echo will be routine, which will lead us to a faster study and improved accuracy. And as you're going to hear later on in this session, there are multiple future applications. Thank you very much.